Suurin piirtein äänet pois eri laitteista. Start in the middle. Okay, hey everyone. My name is Jonas. I'm here to talk about branding and why it matters. Um, how is your forward going? Good. Which today is the second day? Uh, fourth. Fourth day. Yeah. And this is the last workshop. Yeah, before we heading to Imatra, there is few workshops. Okay. And then there is the like the ha hacker house part. The real fun part. Yeah, the real fun part. Is everyone going from here? Yeah. Uh, you go by bus from here, yeah. picks you up straight straight after this. Uh, twelve thirty. Okay. So you have some time. Yeah. Get some food or a pre-drink or whatever you desire. Okay, great. Um, so a bit of background about, about me and why I get to talk about branding. Uh, I am a co-founder and CEO and creative strategist for a marketing agency called Norders. We are a 10 people strong digital full stack agency in Otaniemi Espo, where I've seen him around as well a lot at a grid co-working space. Uh, we concentrate on startups and growth companies and by full stack, I mean the 360 of marketing services from we do maybe 20% marketing strategies, 20% brand identity, 20% digital platforms, mostly websites. We work a lot with B2Bs. 20% uh, growth marketing and advertising such as Google, social media, and 20% event marketing, partnerships, influencers. Not sure if that's 100 or 120 or 140 percent, but pretty equally divided across different marketing activities. Um, we we work with around 100 freelancers every month. We have offices now in in uh, the HQs at Otaniem, as I said, then we have one in, in Norway, Dubai and Riyadh uh, for some random reasons. We can talk about that later. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty passionate about marketing and processes. And we're currently developing our own marketing creative operating system, uh, which we're also building a product for. Uh, maybe it's sort of a... Uh, habit or, or a disease of, of working with startups that it's hard not to get involved with product development as well. So we're building sort of a uh, operating system for, for running your sales and marketing activities, especially for, for startup and growth companies. So that's something we're now combining with, with our agency services. And yeah, that's me in a different picture without a hat. Uh, I've been working in, in digital marketing for 15 years now. I'm originally from Kouvola region, um, so not too far away. Uh, some of you might know the most beautiful place on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I actually brought my dad today here, picked him up from Kouvola uh, on the way here. Uh, I was supposed to be an NHL hockey player like all the good boys from where I'm from, failed at that sorry dad and had to go to the big church and and uh, find something to do this was around 07 digital marketing was really cool and sexy back then so uh, i got attracted to that and now i've been working with uh, large american enterprises small family companies startups and five years ago i launched my my own agency and uh, still still alive today uh, not sure every month how, how it's going to work out, but still today going strong. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting time and place to, to be in marketing. A lot of it is currently changing uh, with, with, especially with the force of digitalization, which seems like an old cliche word but I'll go more in the depth of it and why, why marketing is currently changing really, really rapidly. Um, 
and the focus on branding is really starting to become a bigger and bigger of a deal. Uh, so all of you, you have your own business idea now, service or product concept you're now working on. Yeah. How many of you are working in, in do you have product development uh, that is involved in your, everyone? No one? Is there someone who doesn't have a product development aspect to your business idea? So it's a service business or a network or community business? No, product development. Uh, and I, I'm happy to hear that because then especially I think there are new sort of laws that are, are interesting to you regarding branding. Um, and I think a lot, it's maybe another cliche about product development is that you build a great product and people will find it and love it, right? Um, and you might have also heard that that might not be so much true anymore. Having a great product, you need to have that. That is sort of a given starting point. Uh, you won't succeed without a good product, but not, be, not being able to tell about your product to the people, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, so that's where you need marketing and the way marketing is going today, that's why you also need branding. It's, I just heard actually yesterday that, that uh, a funny marketing quote that no one tells their kids bedtime facts. So it's a lot about storytelling and how we tell the story behind our brand, behind our values, behind our mission. That is really what attracts and resonates with our audience. Uh, and here's a long list. This is supposed to hurt your eyes on purpose. Uh, so a lot is now changing. Why marketing, the part of building your brand and why it matters. This is why branding really is the new force in marketing today is because the change is so rapid now. Uh, five years ago, when we were working with startups, it was a pretty clear marketing strategy that we could copy paste between startups. You have a product, you have a landing page to it, either get a free trial or a book a demo. And then we would do content marketing su uh, supported with paid ads. So we would write blogs, we would answer customer problems and do a SEO heavy content strategy and then put Google ads and LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram ads based on what your target group was. How many of you have ad blockers that you're using? Yeah, 50% here. It's now, it's just getting to 50% of the people on the planet have ad blockers. I can't remember the last time I would have been to a website and I would have approved cookies. So we're not really getting the ads targeted to us anymore the way we were used to. So we're not really getting through the content clutter anymore the way we used to. The world is so full of clutter content that we're not being able to work with inbound marketing methods anymore as efficiently as we were five years ago. Everyone has content. No one is seeing your ads anymore. Inbound marketing is not working anymore. And that's why paid advertising also has become an expense. You can't just do a bottom of funnel, middle of funnel, top of funnel, sales funnels anymore with content and paid advertising because no one's seeing your ads. And now Google, Facebook and the bodies have to increase, increase their click costs. And I guess we shouldn't even get started with Twitter and what's going on there right now. So it's, it's a wild west out there. Another reason why your brand matters more. Another thing that makes things really difficult these days is that once we had an experience with Uber or any really modern cool startup that we like to use and take advantage of, we got used to it. You know the famous story that the first time there ever was internet on an air flight 10, 12 years ago from a flight to LA to Sydney and they announced it was a Virgin, Air, uh, Virgin flight and they announced when the flight took off, hey people, we have internet for the first time ever on airplane. And people started clapping, going crazy. Oh my God, this is amazing, it's a 16 hour flight. We have internet for the whole time, I can get work done. And then the internet broke down like after 10 minutes and people got furious. Well, what the fuck, you can't take internet away from us. You already gave it to us. And the same is happening with customer experience. Once we get used to something, it's really hard to take it back anymore. And the real big trend, the magic word here is seamless omnichannel. So we accept 
expect that once we order something from Vault, we have the same experience on their mobile app, on their web app, and when the food gets delivered to us as well across all the different channels. And once again, five years ago, it would have been pretty easy to copy paste with product, with different sort of online products, a one funnel that works well, well online, but you might not need to have any service on WhatsApp. You might not need to have anyone answering phone calls. You might not need to have an event experience for them. Uh, today, a B2B decision maker has 10 different touch points in 10 different platforms for getting one purchase done. So, and that sounds reasonable. I might send an email, I might do a phone call, I'm definitely gonna visit their LinkedIn page, I'm gonna visit their website page, I might exchange a WhatsApp message with their salesperson. And if that experience is not seamless in, across the, all the different platforms, you're losing me. And that's why, once again, the brand experience really matters. Another thing next on the list is that there are so many great options today. As I said, just having a great product is just where it gets started. We really need to focus on serving a very, very specific niche that has a very, very specific problem. The more niche we can go, the better. The riskier you think it is, the better it is. So having something for everyone is the way it's not going to work. And that's why the brand really needs to be built around your customer problem. This is probably something I was looking at the other workshops. So positioning, building your ideal customer profile, I guess it's something you've been going through in the previous workshops. So I hope this just highlights that importance. Um, and the brand, brand experience really needs to be there to solve my specific problem. I'm not that interested in anymore as a consumer, as a decision maker. Uh, about the features, about the long term, I have a problem now, I'm hungry, I need to get some food, solve my problem now, my specific problem. And that's where the brand experience once again comes in the picture. Um, another thing, because there's so much to choose from, I, I really expect everything to be really riskless these days. Uh, so what's really in it for me? How can you guarantee that I get the ROI that I'm expected to get or how, how do you guarantee I get the food that I'm ordering? Whatever it is, is it consumer business or B2B business? How do you guarantee that this is a riskless decision for me? And that we need to solve with our brand, brand communication. And maybe the biggest trend on this list right now that in the, in the hot digital marketing circles we mostly talk about is the change to dark social. Uh, so that's DMs. I guess these are all pretty interconnected. So these are not working anymore. A huge fact today is that the data shows decision makers are using less and less time on feeds. So the people you really want to target, the people with money, they are not scrolling LinkedIn, even though someone might tell you they do. It's usually salespeople who sc scroll down LinkedIn. Um, they're, not, they're not commenting anymore on posts. They're not sharing posts. Oh, but they are sharing posts, but they're sharing them in DMs. Maybe you've even seen this trend in your own behavior with your friends. Uh, WhatsApp groups are getting more, smaller and smaller. So communication is moving to dark social. And what does that mean for us? Brand owners is that we can't control them anymore. It's like going back to the Tori times where people still talk at Tori and you can't really decide what they talk to about you. So we need to build the brand, we need to give them the, the context, but we can't control how they use it then. Uh, yeah, this is, this is really interesting right now. And, and that's, that's something we pretty much mostly, mostly talk about when we talk about future right now. So how do we solve that problem? And how can we control that? When someone asks, what's the best, uh, like what was happening right here before this started? Like what's the difference between Kiwas? Does Lutes have something? What's the best accelerator for a startup? It's moving more and more back into small circles, one-to-one -one, uh, conversations. And when talking about brand, I don't know how you approach this workshop, um, but when talking about a brand in, in startup context, you very often think about the business brand. Uh, 
I don't know, did any one of you really think about personal branding when coming to this workshop? Was that on top of your mind or it could be part of this? One head nodding carefully. Um, not least due to how platforms like LinkedIn, Instagram and the, the bodies show content these days is that, for example, a LinkedIn profile like the ones with Norders, we have 1,000 followers on LinkedIn. We post what I think really, really cool content. We do a really cool video. We put a lot of thought, money, energy behind it. We get like three likes because the algorithm just doesn't show branded content. Uh, I post a selfie on my way to work. Uh, that's not very thought out. It's not very good, but the platform supports personal brands and content they put out and get a lot more visibility. And that means not least due to the platforms and the algorithm is how they support spreading content is that personal brands start to really dominate thought leaderships. Maybe it's also partly due to, as I said, all, everything's interconnected here, that there's so much content, there's so many good products, there are so many great brands, there's so much to choose from, there's so much noise out there all the time that who do we trust? We go back in the old times, we trust people, we don't, we don't do intensive search about Kiwas, but we ask Lauri about Kiwas and we trust Lauri's opinion because he's a buddy, he knows personal brands start to dominate thought leadership again. So having, I think that's something you really want to focus on throughout, like I talk about brand, I go very tactical soon, don't worry. Um, but I talk about branding without the context or dividing it between the business brand and personal brands. But that's something I really recommend that you start thinking about strongly if you haven't already, who's the face of your company? How, how is that face going to be uh, communicated to the world? Is that going to be a very engineering kind of strong uh, product oriented face of the company? Or is it going to be more like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos go crazy kind of figure? Uh, but having a strong personal brand for your product, for your company uh, is key. And it's something that you can still get a good head start with. Um, I definitely see that most of the startups that we start working with, they really believe in product democracy. They like, we have this super amazing product. We have cool website, cool visual identity for it. Let's go. So one thing that you can really differentiate your business idea with is having a strong personal brand behind it. Um, and last, but unfortunately not least for you is that brands that have stuck around the longest usually win. So it's just having a new brand on the market is difficult. It takes time. And especially now we see that brands that made it through recession, brands that through made it worse, through pandemics, they, they start to get that cumulative effect compounding effect to work for them. So stay patient, it takes time. And now when when world is in turmoil, uh, it just takes long for consumers, for decision makers to trust a brand. So, and an answer to that is then, if you're a new brand uh, partner, who are the partners who've been there for a long time, who are the trustworthy brands that you can partner with to create that credibility and trustworthiness for you? Uh, I, I like to talk <laughs> a lot. My, my strong suit is not asking questions, so now I remembered it. So I'll ask anything else to add here? Any questions about these? Am I, is, is my talk clear? Good. Okay, so that's why brand matters. Uh, it's really put all that into one package, one sentence to, to communicate how you're different in providing value to your customer. Like it was really cool to see the workshops that you had here. Uh, I think that was a great list. End of the day, who can tell their customers that they can solve their problems better than others. That's what it is about. And that's what branding is, building that communication framework. And then into the tactical part of it, where we'll spend more time now. A good brand is made out of five different stages. Strategy, 
identity, channels, content, and then finally the distribution of the brand. And now we'll, we'll go through them. So five, five parts, they're not all equal. And depending on what your, what your business plan is, what your concept is, what your target market is, you want to focus on, on slightly different things. Let's start with the strategy. Um, how many of you already have a business plan written out? Not all. Um, the good news is, or the bad news, depending what kind of a person you are, this is definitely the most important part. This is your Northern Star. This is your blueprint for everything you do. So good news is if you like writing business plans, if you like writing mission statements, if, you like, if you're a visionary type that likes to put things on paper, you're going to love this part and you're loving the fact that it's really, really important. If you are more of a uh, engineering type of person that doesn't like strong visionary statements, this might not be your favorite part. Uh, I see a bit of this going on. Or this is not big enough for the back row. I'll go through them. I'll share these anyways. Um, the strategy part, I have divided then into two main sections. We have the objectives and key results that your company has. That's like the, the long big picture that you want to have. What's the purpose of your company? Why do you exist? That's sort of the base of the base. You have a reason for existence. There's a problem in the market. Uh, very traditional ways. There's, I started a marketing agency because I didn't think modern marketing agencies were doing a good agile job in the new digital world. So I started my own, I scratching my own itch. Very, very traditional purpose for having behind your business. What value do you bring to the world? What's in it for me? Uh, what problem are you solving? And then what's the brand story behind it? And that's more of a then already creative part of it. Why do I exist? What value do I create? And what's my story behind it? And that's, if that is done well, I wouldn't take your money to build a good website or you don't need cool branding videos. You don't need big advertising budgets. You don't need social media channels. If this is done really, really well, you start a free, you put a medium page, write this out and have your phone number there. That's how powerful those are and it will work. But usually they don't. There's a lot of noise out there. You're new, we're new, we're small, uh, so we need more. So that's when we, using this space, we start to uh, narrow it down into what the vision behind our purpose is. What is our ideal customer profile, our niche, who are we serving? And I think these are something that you've already been talking about in the previous workshops. Um, one thing that we see a lot of, a lot of success these days is that we focus on positioning. So how are you different from everyone else? So for example, for Norders, yeah, we're creating a creative operating system, it's like we're actually creating it, but a big part of it just that we look different from all the other agencies. So when you're like, we have all these agents, but hey, Norders, they had that weird, what was that SOOS thing? So they look a bit different, they sound a bit different how you look at the pool of all the competitors, all the similar products that are there, and they are there no matter in what business you are, direct or indirect, how do you differentiate yourself from them? It can be something very, very small, detailed, or it can be something very big. And here is also, it's, this is the danger zone because you don't want to sound too clever, right? It still needs to be very clear. Uh, your ideal customer needs to understand it. It needs to resonate. Um, so this is where we see a lot of success, but also challenges here. Um, what problem we're solving for the customer, not what our problems are, but what the customer problems are. Uh, once again, we're always in a hurry. Uh, you're checking your phones, you're thinking about other things, you're going to Imatrasu and there's so many things going on. What is the problem today, right now that you can solve? And and another thing where we see great success now with our customers is that let's not focus on one problem. We need to actually list them all. Uh, a classic sort of uh, wellness business example would be that I want to lose weight. 
one of the most traditional business concepts out there. But you also need to touch the fact how to eat healthier, sleep better, having better mental being, all of the list, all of the problems that the customer might have need to be listed today. Not enough just to have one. So if you had a one customer problem, get back to the problem board, list them all. What is the offer that we, with what offer do we solve the problem and what is the expected value for the customer? If you, if you work in, in B2B or something to do with money, it's always the easiest if you can have a numeric value to it, right? So if I say, if you give me a thousand euro, if you give me one money and I guarantee you that you get 10 back, right? That's a very, very great offer. Like it would be very stupid not to take that offer. But often it can be very soft ROI. Like you're going to feel better at some point. Like meditation still has that huge problem in that business model that, well, if you do it for two months and you might feel better and you're not going to be that stressed out anymore, it's a soft ROI. Whereas with numericals, it's a bit easier to communicate, but you still need to have something behind it and how it is perceived. That's the strategy part. This is my favorite part. Uh, if you did listen and remember what I talked early, so 50% of the time I'm CEO and 50% of the time I'm creative strategist. So this is mostly what I do uh, with, my, with my clients. And if we get a new client, I usually I work with them at this stage. So if these are things that interest you, uh, these are the things I can help you most with. Uh, not a disclaimer, what I'm going to share next, I'm also uh, keen on, but this is definitely my specialty. Yes. Is, it, is business plan absolutely necessary for an engineering company? Ah, uh, yes. But business plan, um, there's no right or wrong format for it. Um, so that's sort of a lame answer for it, but you... So do I have to write the 30 pages or uh, can I still do it? Can what do? Like yeah, yeah, I think I would rather do that. Okay. And, and depending on the market, uh, like doing a five-year five year business plan, like I, I can't remember a time I would have seen a, an industry where that would be required. I personally would be more interested in what you have going on for Q, Q1 next year. Uh, so yeah, business kind of as I would rather do than a 30 page business plan. Yeah, that's the danger in mentioning business plan is that when you Google it and you see like McKinsey document about it, like, well, uh, but I would, these I would attach to it anyways. I don't think these are not like put down in, in the, Business Canvas. Have you gone through uh, Business Canvas here? Is everyone familiar with it? Uh, maybe we'll give it a look at the end of that. that if that was good, good point, really interesting. Uh, oh, so actually, yeah, here, here it is how we've done, for example, our business plan at what level? I thought I'm going to jump ahead of this. So yeah, so this is the level Norders have done, and this is the same framework we use with our clients. So our niche is one small paragraph. It's, it's not on purpose, or it's not purposeful that you see the exact words, but the length of different parts. So we're not spending weeks and months on writing about the purpose or writing about the ideal customer profile, who knows what war is gonna turn out next week or what Twitter is gonna do with the platform. So these needs to be interactive, collaborative. These are, you don't print them out and put them on your wall. These need to be able to change next week if the market so shifts. Problems listed in one sentences, super quick, offer ROI. We can deliver numerical value with orders so we can put cool Excel sheet behind it. So that's the level of sort of business planning I, I do with my clients and I recommend. And we use a very professional Canva tool to it. So it's not, it's not about the tool, it's about the context. Okay, so now we have a beautiful strategy done. 
Uh, we know of other customer problems, how we're going to solve them, uh, with what kind of offer, what sort of expected value they get. Then we get to the more of a traditional branding part, to build the actual brand identity, and especially a visual brand identity. Uh, it is also still, still super, super important. Uh, words are just one thing. We like visuals, depending once again a bit on the, the industry you're in, but you still need to have some sort of brand identity. The good news is no one cares about your logo. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see with startups that we really want to spend a lot of time on the logo. Yeah, I think the biggest part, the most important part of the logo is that you might need to be looking at it every day. So if you hate it, that can be a bit of friction. So when things go get really rough and everything fails, if you hate your logo too, it might be that one thing too much. So have a logo that you can deal with uh, and maybe a logo that once again helps you position yourself a bit differently. So not the exact same kind of logo that everyone else has, but no one really cares about your logo. That's, that's the good news. But this is sort of a pretty standard brand kit that we mostly do with startups. You have a logo in different versions. So for dark background, for white background, you have some sort of icons. Once again, do you need one or three or five icons? Depends, doesn't really matter. Slide deck is probably the most important part you have. A cool pitch deck, cool slide deck that can really communicate what you're doing. If you're trying to get funding or if you're trying to get clients, having, having a proper professional looking slide deck. And once again, it needs to be understandable. That's the most important part. I recommend doing a brand book early on. Once again, it, it does really need to have a lot, how to use and not use your logo, what are your colors, what fonts do, or even what kind of fonts do you prefer. Uh, it's just a bit easier once you get that funding, once you get that first customer and you need someone to do you a website, you need someone to do you a, some sort of digital platform, app, anything, then you have it and any freelancer or any agency can can get started with it. Once again, like tools like Canva has really great templates for all of these. Uh, here's, here's quickly how our, ours look. So logo, colors, how to use, how not to use our fonts. So I would, let's, let's talk about timelines. I think that gives maybe good context. The marketing strategy phase what we usually do is it's around four weeks that we spend on it with, with startups. There's usually a workshop per week and an insights research part per week for four weeks. So four workshops for insights research. That means we maybe call ex-customers, future customers, ideal customers, potential partners, and a lot of Googling basically. And then in the workshops, we talk about like about your passion and then create the narrative and so on. Strategy for four weeks. Brand identity max two weeks. So this is not. This is not. This is not that important. It's. It's important to have. It's not important to focus on. And having what I listed just now, having some sort of color, some sort of logo, and if I if I would like to go stupid on something, I might go stupid on font. So look at what sort of font would really differentiate you from competition in the market. And fonts tell a lot, is it, it's going to be a really soft, round font, very beautiful, quiet, or a very strong font that has, that has a bit more usually power than, than we might think about. If you want to take it to the next level, if you are in consumer business or in service business especially, having some sort of visuals behind it, images, photos, and videos do help. Uh, in orders, for example, we're in service business, so we really sell ourselves. So us constantly updating our personal images. We take team photos all the time. You usually buy, you, like there's a lot of digital marketing. You either sort of like me or you don't like me. So you buy in orders people, not the actual services we do. Uh, and that goes for all the services businesses. If you are, if you have a product, then a bit maybe more focus on icons. And, and maybe then focus on the personal brand of the, the leader, have good quality images of the founder, founders, uh, 
the face of the company, but this is this is already nice next level stuff having pictures and videos done. Yeah, important. And once again, important, but important also to like go through quickly. Uh, I look at colors often from the differentiation factor. So like fintech industry is now sort of interesting. Like if you, if you would have started a financial technology business 10 years ago, you would look at all the banks and they're all blue and you would do any other color and you would be good to go. Now you might need to do a bit more research because so many new fintech startups have emerged. Uh, but the way we look at colors at the strategy stage is that, okay, who are your competitors? Who would people compare you to? And then just usually go different unless it's an industry where it's really important for some reason that you do look alike. Uh, a very classic example of this is high fashion. Like if you look at high fashion from Europe, they all have the same exact black logo, right? Because in that industry, it's really important that you look the part. You're one of the high fashion brands, so they all look the same and it's an important factor of that. But usually a quick, ex quick advice would be just to look a bit different with the colors. Marketing agencies these days, there's a lot of purple, a uh, lot of bright colors, so we're we're going pretty strong now with the with the black and green, some orange too. Okay, strategy done. Now we also have a quick and dirty brand identity to get us forward. Uh, then you need channels that you can then communicate through. This is from our own, own strategy and presentation. We're personally uh, Wix Editor X partner when it comes to websites, but any website platform, once again, depending on like your, who you need to communicate with, can you just get like a free medium page might be enough for you uh, if you need to build a complex WooCommerce uh, online store, but having your main owned platform uh, is still is still important. Anything from yeah medium page to complex coded uh, community platforms, but that that is your main 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 place. And the importance of that is that because then you own what happens in that channel. Uh, whereas yeah, Twitter is too easy of an example. But having your business relying on Google advertising or your Facebook profile, you're just too vulnerable for whatever might happen on that platform. So having your own owned main channel, uh, I'll, I'll always want to start there. After that, you'll have your external channels. Are you in consumer facing business? Do you really need to be on TikTok? Are you talking to B2B decision makers on LinkedIn? Uh, what are the external channels you need to be on? Uh, how do you outreach? How do you can directly communicate to your clients, even at the funding stage? Usually startups looking for funding, they often like, should we have a LinkedIn ad for VCs? Like there's what, 50 VCs in Finland, let's just call them. Let's do an outreach call campaign and ask if we can send our pitch deck to them. Uh, email, LinkedIn, newsletters, phone calls, easy outreach, but once again, planned out. What's our message? What's our value prop? Uh, who, do we, who do we communicate to and with what angle? Uh, last but not least, word events is missing here, but partners and events. What events do you need to be present at? Is it GIUAS or a, a industry networking event or a product event? And who are the partners? I think especially at this stage, for all of you, uh, like finding partners to work with uh, is really important. It could be something as simple as if you're, if you're building a product on AWS, for example, then you could just like, we're, we're on AWS. And it doesn't really mean anything, but mildly tells my brain that I trust AWS. So 
I trust a bit more of you as well. Do you get that connection? And obviously, like stronger partners, better partners you have. All the startups are then very eager to tell who that, where the VCs that back them are, because that creates credibility once again. So this is another thing I think it's good for you to focus on now, who are the partners that work in your advantage right now. Here's our simple website, our LinkedIn page. Nothing fancy, does the job. Okay, strategy done. We have a brand identity. We even have channels now that have been built around our strategy and brand identity. Then we need some content to tell about our brand. Uh, anyone here aware of who Gary V is? One, okay, we have a few, few things we might wanna check out here. Gary V is this, like he was the first person to sell something on YouTube. He had a wine business in New Jersey and he started like a wine channel on YouTube in like 1920s or something. And, uh, and now he is an owner of Vayner Media, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, media company uh, does media advertising in the world for companies like Pepsi and GM and, and the, the big guns. And he has this content pillar, uh, content pyramid framework that we've stolen with pride and use for ourselves and for, for our uh, customers is that one of the biggest problems we see uh, with all the companies, both with startups and, and companies that have been around longer is that we don't have time to create content. Like, yeah, we should be doing videos, we should be doing podcasts, we should be writing blogs. We never have time for it. If you do have time for it, it usually means your business is going well. If, you, if your business is doing well, you definitely won't have time for it. So Gary Vee has created this content pyramid system. So basically it is that you create a pillar piece of content. The ideal, the best kind of pillar piece of content in the world would be your own Netflix series. So that's the ultimate pillar content. So you would have a Netflix show. There's still not a finished Netflix show, by the way. So someone's going to be the first one to have their own Netflix reality show in Finland. And that would be the ultimate piece of pillar content to have a TV show about you that would then be like one masterpiece or a documentary or a movie about you. Okay, so that might be a bit too ahead for, for most of us. Next best thing is a book these days. That you already see a lot more uh, startups writing a book that how to do this in this and that field. That's actually something we're now writing uh, with Norders, a, a book about creative operating system and the magic behind it. So I've, I've even heard a sentence every while, once in a while that a, a book is an ultimate business card these days. So uh, I have this business, I wrote a book about it. That's a lot of credibility for you. Um, and even if it's then an Amazon bestseller, even better. Okay, book is quite a bit too, it's like, whoa, do I need to write a book now? No, then like a simple white paper, simple ebook, 10 pages, 10,000 words. You can easily write thousand words in two hours. If you dedicate an hour a day, in less than a month, you'll have a solid ebook done. Ultimate guide to something. You've seen those around online. Uh, and once again, if you did the strategy part well, uh, this is pretty actually easy to do. So you have a 10,000 word ebook, the ultimate guide on the value you're providing. The ultimate guide to building a good brand, for example. 10,000 words, a good blog is 500 words. So you wrote this in less than a month. In two weeks, you wrote this. A good blog is 500 words. That's by Google, not by me. So you want your blog to be 500 words. So you have 20 blogs that you can then di divide this into. 20 blogs, you, you're okay if you publish one, two a month, you can take July off. So you, oh, my blog strategy is done for entire year all of a sudden. And then these blogs, the next stage that not mentioned here is micro content. Then you divide these blogs into 100 word, captions for social media posts 
oh, all of a sudden you have a social media post for each day of the week. So two weeks of writing, you have your content done for the entire year. You're welcome. Uh, huge magic in that we do a lot of those ultimate guide to problem you're solving. Uh, these days and yeah, next level then uh, these 500 words that you wrote down or took from the pillar content, put a camera on, talk it out loud to that or just record it to your iPhone, you have a podcast and that's it. Putting content out is important even though it might not break the bank, it might not create a lot of leads for you, the funding might not come through it, but at that stage when the VC is taking you out if this business is for real, once the client, potential client is taking you out if this business is for real, if your social media is active, if you talk about their problem on your podcast, they're not going to look at how many listeners do you have. They'll go, oh, these guys talk about the problem I have on their podcast. They really must know a lot about my problem. They didn't know you did that in two weeks. And I really want to focus on this, just having that content out there. If you list those 10 problems for the pillar content, you write thousand words for each problem your customer has. You never need to worry about any kind of content funnels. If you want to go geeky about it, you can talk about like, how do I get their attention on social media? The best way to get the attention is bright colors, quick movement. That's why the ads are the way they are. Then we talk about the problem. Hey, marketing agency owner, oh, they got my attention. Do you need more sales? Okay, they talk about my problem. We've given more sales for 300 different agency owners. Oh, I can trust these guys. Just by 10,000 euros a month, you can get more sales like all the others do. Went through the customer journey there. Um, this is already next level to divide that into those. List 10 problems that your customer has write thousand words for it, you have content for the entire year. There's so much magic behind that and not too many are still using that. Most startups, most, your, most of your future competition is paying three to 30,000 a month for content creation. So here's an example. We have an, one of our ebooks is how can B2B technology and service business leaders and marketers scale their sales and marketing. These are 10,000 words, just a Google Doc, nothing fancy, just a Google Doc we send out and then that is divided into blocks and then I use that same camera, I'm filming this and then there's a teleprompter behind it, 70 euros from verkokauppa.com. Then I read that thing to the camera, we have a YouTube channel. I take the audio recording of it. We have a podcast and you might have noticed my excitement behind this pillar content thing. Strategy done, identity done. We have the channels to put the content to. We even have now content for the entire year. Still uh, more work to do, it sucks. Uh, then we need to distribute it. Uh, we need to put the podcast somewhere. A sort of a classic advice that I think is sucks that content creation is 20% distribution is 80%. I think distribution is pretty easily done these days. Uh, everything can be very easily automated distribution wise. There are really cool tools for that. I think most of the, most of the startups we work with don't struggle with this. They struggle with the content creation part. Uh, but then you still do need to get this done. Um, I think you've now already more or less mapped out the customer journey in the previous workshops somewhat. No, maybe, no. Uh, well, an easy customer journey would then be, let's use us as an example. Um, we want to talk with startup founders. We need to get their attention with our ad, uh, the ad might say, read our free ebook on how to scale your startup. And then they check out that free ebook, uh, the pillar content. Then 
with that, we always have a what's a so-called soft and hard CTA. Hard CTA is that we want money or time. So book a meeting. We don't ask immediately for money. Book a meeting. Soft CTA is uh, subscribe to our blog, newsletter, YouTube channel, depending on where this was distributed. Distribution organic and paid. So you post it on your social media. It doesn't cost anything. You can automate that pretty easily. If you throw 50 euros behind it on a month, you're going to then already have thousands of views per month. So it's still, we still use paid advertising, just the power of it is not the same anymore. Um, see our pillar content, then either immediately if they need services right now, there's different kind of people. I'm one of those I like to, before I, I buy a 70 euro teleprompter for my camera, I look at YouTube videos for like three months before I make that purchase decision. Then there are people who are like, oh, cool car ad, I'm going to buy one of those. So we have different kind of people. So you need to have sort of funnels for both. Uh, so they can always dig deeper into the content. But at some point you need like, okay, man, like, let's just, let's just talk, just buy this now. So you need to have that at, at the end, at some point. Uh, or then they can jump to it at any stage. So we've had the channels previously done out. It might be on TikTok, it might be on LinkedIn, it might be on your Medium. We also see a lot of startups doing really cool stuff on like Quora and Reddit. I think those both are still underutilized in Finland especially. So those could be sort of like blue ocean channels to get some cool, cool stuff done. Uh, and then, yeah, that I try to like talk more about this but it's, it's pretty straightforward, but I feel like I, I left it out empty because it feels straightforward to me. Any questions about this part? Distribution tactics, how to share the content. How many of you do have a consumer business plan that you talk with individual people, not businesses? Is, can, they, can they buy it online for directly from you? Is that direct to consumer? They can buy it from you. Can they buy it from someone else than you? Can they buy it from Prisma or... Uh, yeah. So, so for you guys, then the partners are really like huge at this stage. If, if you can like have your product at Prisma ad between Tansi Tähti and Kansa, like you can't, it, it's going to take a long time for you to be able to do that same kind of stunt yourself. Uh, consumers are a lot harder. Uh, privacy laws are a lot stricter. Um, one of the reasons I asked if you, if you do have a B2B business plan, the privacy laws are pretty flexible on contacting business directly. So you can like buy a list of thousand companies on your industry and just email them all and say, hey, we have this cool new thing, check it out. And that is pennies and you will get one client from that campaign. Uh, so th the distribution is a lot easier in B2B sector with consumers, like there's, yeah, there's a lot of competition uh, getting your, like, and often with consumer business, you need masses, same with you, like, yeah. Like even, even in more expensive consumer business, like selling one car, it's not enough if you're a car manufacturer, uh, you need to sell a lot of cars. So you need masses. So then you need to get the attention of masses and then eventually there's not that many people buying that actual product. So partners, even, even bigger of a key. Can I ask what's your business? Uh, <clears throat> personalized weekly recipe plan for mm. households. For entire household? Yeah, like bigger than two persons. But you can just buy the groceries from Prisma. It's more like we personalize the recipes that they can try new stuff and it's like more for their fit. They don't uh, think about it. And we also deliver the recipe ingredients to their home. Oh, okay. Uh, is that, does that have some sort of like health angle? Yeah, it can like if you're want to do certain diet, you can do that. Or if you go to the gym, you get like more protein hmm. that way. Cool. At what stage are you now in? 
Um, we're still like uh, shaping the idea because we left out one competitor from the analysis, so there's some stuff we need to do. To, at this stage, it's quite quite easy to copy the plan we're doing, so we need to do some protection. Yeah. And you guys, like, if you want to go the hard way, you need to think about influencers as well as 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 a channel, and that's a that's another wild west as you might know already. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's it could give you a really cool head start, like if if you get get like Prisma or something. I don't know how like is Oda here in Lappeenranta? Oda, Oda, you know the Norwegian food delivery business. Uh, I don't know what like. They hired a lot of really, really big guns, Finnish marketing directors. Like, like I'm, they're spending a lot of on their Finnish marketing personnel right now. Like the, the list of names that they hired in Finland are, yeah, like big, big names. Uh, so like they might also be interested in something like that. I'm sure they're investing now a lot in Finnish market. So like having one of those partners instead of like having yeah, ex hockey players talk about your stuff. It's it's gonna could be a lot cheaper of a way. Uh, and once again, then you could apply B two B tactics to it. So talking to Prisma or Oda or Gesco, like you don't need to have a huge TikTok campaign to do that. You can just call them out and have a meeting. Um, cool. That's a bit of our distribution forward there too. So being being foundable, being search engine optimized, having your content organically delivered across social media channels, having the right partners, being able to take the funnel to the end, be making it easy to buy. Yes. Uh, how much does the Google Ads cost? Uh, depends a lot on the industry and the market, obviously. Um, I mean, their minimum is one, uh, one euro a day. So technically you can get started with that. What's your business? Uh, we are a group of three and we are building a uh, software app where a customer can track their electricity consumption and we can give like advices when to use electricity and when to not. So uh, for example, customer is uh, warming up a sauna and we can uh, give advice in the app that don't warm it now, the spot price is very high mm. and give an advice for like warm it in two hours and you will save 20 hours. I would quickly argue, Google has free tools for it, but I would quickly argue that not the, not the easiest competition, so if I so like the keywords would be like sähkön kulutus, right? Like optimoi sähköä, säästä sähköä, right? Would be my keywords. Uh, I would guess all the electricity companies are going to be there and they're going to have, I, if I may assume bigger marketing budgets that you still do, um, you might be paying f five to even eight euros a click. Uh, so then it depends on how many clicks you want each day. Um, so if, you, if your marketing budget is 10 euros, uh, then like, and you can expect traffic of maybe two. But the problem is then that I think these like big boys are also doing, they can outbid you. So they can even say like, because not all the industries sort of play by the, uh, the standard price of what Google estimates the one click to be. Um, but they can actually say that we're willing to pay 10 euros for each click. And if you don't have that in your budget, and if you don't put that as your upper limit in Google Ads, then you, it just doesn't show. The good side of that is that you don't, like, you don't spend money if you don't get clicks. That's why Google is nice to play around with. And often we start with Google because it's like on social media, it's pretty easy to burn money. They will, take your, they will show your ads and take your money. But with Google, if you don't get traffic, if you don't get clicks, you're not going to spend any money. Uh, so having a Google budget, Google Ads budget, uh, would be would be really important. So spending time on, are you guys technical yourself? Can you work around Google Ads? Um, having someone, 
the good thing about that is that that is really cheap to outsource from anywhere around the world. Um, so, but having someone who understands Google Ads would be important because, yeah, that's going to be something that's going to be a lot Googled. Uh, it might also be a bit of a younger audience, uh, more tech technically savvy audience that is really interested in your product. And a sort of a blue ocean channel for you guys might be YouTube, uh, where, which is the second biggest search, um, search engine now in the world after Google. So when someone searches in, in YouTube, Sähkön hinta, then it would be, or I'm sure, I'm 100% sure that's going to be a lot cheaper. So then they could show your ad. So that, that might be a quick, quick and dirty trick to do uh, there. And that's, that's about the Google, Google ads. Yeah, I would have search ads, but I would, I would go YouTube heavy to make it cheaper. And I think your audience might be there. But then building that content, being like organically foundable, uh, spending more time on that. Ultimate guide on how to save on your electricity. Google loves the word ultimate. So that's why that's very trendy right now. So because they search all the sites and who has the best answer to the search. So if you say the ultimate answer, Google is like, oh, wow, <laughs> I'll show this. Uh, that's why you see a lot of ultimate guides to everything these days. Um, I've only done an hour. Uh, but I really enjoyed talking about your businesses. Uh, is, does someone else have any questions? I'd be happy to. Or you have follow-ups. Do you like physical advertisements like posters? Yeah, I love them. If, if your target group is, yeah, uh, geographically uh, attained, um, absolutely. So like, are you planning to start out in a certain yeah, geographical yeah, location? Small, yeah. Like, is there any laws like, can I put posters anywhere? There are a lot of laws against it and you can't, but you definitely should. Uh, like it's the, there's no consequences there. Uh, with any kind of outreach, which that falls under, there's going to be some people who, uh, are not going to be happy about it. In Finnish, we, I love the term mielensä pahottaja. In, in this scenario, you're going to get text messages and phone calls and emails like, stop spamming my mailbox. And that's just part of the game. You need to get over it. Uh, but yeah, that's a very efficient way to get it, get it done. Um, that is still, yeah, part of outreach. It's, it's also, it's a bit spammy. So now you don't know if they have the exact need. Only thing you need, they live in a location that they could use your service. Uh, we we do Google more and more stuff. Like we we control around hundred websites for all kinds of brands, mostly in the Nordics, and we see now that people don't go to Norders agency. They Google Norders agency and click go through Google. So we Google more and more, we search stuff on YouTube more and more. And that is the best way because then you have the purchase intent already. Like I don't, I don't Google anything for fun. I always like, I need information. I want to buy something. I'm looking for something. So like even, even then I think those could be supportive with each other that you can do the, you can drop mail on everyone's mailbox. Uh, but still, I would, they're, they're not going to look at it and they're going to forget it. It's a long game, but when they have the need for it, like what to eat this week, that's the search right you, you want to catch when I have that problem. Like, oh, family's yelling, wife is getting angry, kid is hungry. I have the purchase intent. Um, I, I really like spending a lot of resources on, on Google and YouTube in that sense. Um, and, and you guys could definitely also, one thing I didn't mention here that is, is really cool of an idea is like having a network effect behind it. So me earning points, if I recommend you to my neighbor, for example, uh, one of the most like famous marketing stunts ever was, uh, this was like 1920s or something, but Dropbox was getting big 
it's actually not 1920s. I tried to be funny there. So 1920s was not when it was, but Dropbox was getting big, but they noticed that Google algorithms were uh, changing, so they couldn't anymore get positive ROI from someone Googling cloud storage and signing up for Dropbox. So they did that get one gigabyte for free if you recommend us. And that changed and escalated their entire business. So that's called a network effect that once I try your recipe, it would have a very strong uh, final page on the app or the email would be that get the next one for free, recommend us to your partner. And there's once again, there's like super good free tools for this, like managing these, these things. Uh, so I think that might be something. I can't really think of a business where that couldn't work also with, with your electricity saving business. I, did you like saving five euros on your sauna night? Recommend us and I don't know if you can't get next recommendation for free or whatever it would be. It's a bit of a more than the creative side of it. And those are also fun to test around what works and what resonates. Anything else? I'd like to say thank you. This was super inspiring. And oh, great. Really so helpful. Please. Cool. For me, uh, my product, I'm, I'm uh, designing new panties for women. Mm. So my main problem have been like, because there is an obvious problem, I made a survey for ladies and 100 answered and 95% of them said that they believe their panties are like badly designed. So my problem has been because there is so many panties, how can you bring the like the real problem in the surface? And I believe the problem is to make blogs and blogs and stuff about it to have the discussion and mm. then go forward like the story and everything. So. I'm blacking out a bit here, but Spanx, right? Spanx is the thing. Well, Spanx, yes, kind of, yeah, but Spanx is still, it's not like a normal panties. Yeah. It's like special ones. So if you want to have a normal, just normal panties, you cannot really find a proper one or that it's made of bad fabric. Mm. And uh, are you familiar with the Spanx story? Have you? Yeah, I know, like, yeah, yeah. I know something about that's that's a that's not the bad worst story for you to like go pretty deep into and yeah. forget the product part of it but just the story so how she did it the Spanx founder was that so she would get the first partners the the department stores so Macy's and Bloomberg and she would get them to take a few panties of hers yeah. then she would sneak in during the day and take the panties to a better location next to cashiers and then she would actually pay her friends to go and buy them so then the department stores would, whoa these are moving fast what happened here so then the department stores would start taking in so she also started with a strong partner focus and get the department stores on board and was really creative with no resources for it and once she got that going that she wouldn't need to pay her friends anymore <laughs> to buy them, uh, she got the actual first customers because now the department stores were actually displaying them properly, which was a key, especially back then before e-commerce. Uh, and then she would get her actual first customers and then she would really build, she was one of the really famous community builders, so really build a community around them. Uh, Plant-based food did that very well before the pandemic as well that they would sort of build the first raving fans around the people that were like very against meat. And maybe for you, it's like the women who are really angry about bad panties and they could be your raving fans and then start building out from there. So once again, finding the right partners at first and then like having that those first like first fans, yeah. how she those were the two tactics. I think she mastered very well and both are pretty much free. To, to get done uh, a lot of leg work and that that usually sucks but um, but yeah are you planning to do uh, direct to consumer behind yeah. it too so I could buy I could buy it online you have an online store yeah, I've, I've been thinking that's easier way to access 
process than to get get it first on on stores. I'm not sure, but I have seen some good examples. For example, there is um, stockings, mm. and they just deliver to your home. It's like well, the product is beautifully done and all the packaging has every, and everything and it's easy because you can put it in the mailbox. So it's like cheap also to, yeah, that's true. to uh, deliver. Yeah. I think that's my like... Don't want to be a party pooper here, yeah. but your competition is stiff. Like, yeah, the, I know, I know. Uh, yeah. so if, if you do have a product innovation that you can sell to investors, yeah. uh, then you, but you do need a, if you want to go to direct to consumer D to C route, you do need a big marketing budget because there are like yeah. the, the big brands are spending millions while we speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I don't want to sound boring, but the partners might yeah, be, okay say, yeah. I didn't know that yeah, but the partners might be, and uh, I mean, partners like also online stores, they're always fighting with each other. So like who could stand out, who, which one of the online stores could differentiate in their market by having your product, uh, supporting a new uh, like startup and, and all that. So, and once you have the partner system worked out and have your first fans, then building on your own online store might be easier. Thank you, I'll keep that online. Yeah. Anything else? This is off topic, but um, have you found it easy to recruit talent for your startup? Yes, I mean, well, we don't, we're still at the, the funding gathering stage for the OS. So we, we're not at the product development stage yet. So we're, we're recruiting for, for creative services and there's a huge surplus on the market now. It's almost, it's, it, it feels bad because there are so many unemployed creatives now on the market. Uh, so I'm, I'm in an industry where people are like, that's where digitalization, globalization hit really hard because you can now have a, like we do a lot of Google ad services. There's someone from Sri Lanka or, or India or, or Ukraine it has now like, obviously for very unfortunate reasons, very cheap labor now that are willing to work. Um, so having really, 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 really talented, creative uh, talent available is, is definitely an advantage at our industry right now. Uh, there are a lot of digital agencies. Mm -hmm. How do you like, how do you recognize a good one? Uh, how, do you, how do you pick the one that you're going to hire? It's, it's a people business, definitely. So it's, it's a culture match often. So I would do this. I think this goes for a lot of services. Um, you do a short list. So Google, a uh, good creative agency, a uh, good digital marketing agency. Then I don't know if any, anyone's ever been on the Google's third page, but maybe on the first and second page, you, you do a short list to open different tabs. You choose maybe five to eight of those that resonate. Uh, you obviously you drop those that you don't understand. Like this is bad communication. They can't communicate for themselves. They probably can't communicate for me. You drop those, build a short list of five to eight, uh, then organize meetings with maybe four to five of them. And like, hey, this is my problem. How would you start solving it? If it makes sense, uh, trust your gut. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a people business. They have references. Did they, do they understand the industry? Have they helped a company like yours in the past? That's usually a good sign. Uh, like if, if you have, I wouldn't maybe hire us for you. Like a consumer business, not our strong suit. We work with B2B. Uh, not all might say that, but so if they have references, they can show in the back. And agencies, we're, we're fairly good at what we do as a marketing strategy, many agencies might do for free as an offer for you. So like they start talking about your like, this could be your vision and this could be your narrative. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of ourselves that we like, okay, before we can really help you, we need to do the strategy to understand you. Um, but yeah, trust your gut, do a short list, meet three to five. Uh, it's really a people business if you like the person. 
and whoever you choose, you're going to fail. It's going to be a miserable <laughs> failure. Then you learn <laughs> and next time you're a bit more educated to pick a better one. Uh, but yeah, and um, I think the trend is now moving a bit towards in-house again. There was a big shift just when the pandemic started, everyone kicked, like another reason why it's so easy for us to recruit, everyone kicked their marketing teams away. And that's when like our business really started, we grew 400% in 2020 because everyone kicked their in-house marketing team away and they need an agency like, oh, okay, we can help you. Uh, but I think that shift is going back. So I would also recommend once you're at the diff certain stage, hire a Google specialist, hire a digital marketer for yourself to take ownership of it because like, someone else having control over your brand, uh, it's, it's risky and they will never do as a good job as, as the founding team will. Um, I have a question maybe to be uh, again associated with the uh, digital marketing uh, markets, the mm. digital marketing market here in Finland. So uh, is there a trend or are you seeing a trend coming from uh, the data-driven perspective that more and more digital agencies would uh, try to develop some data-driven cap capabilities, how to, so those are strategies of course could be based on some data, could be 100% data-driven or intuition or got through it. So what is the trend you're seeing? Uh, I, th I might be w watching the industry a bit too close because I'm so involved in it. Uh, but I think we're already over the tipping point, actually. I think the data-driven like shift happened from like 17 to 20. That's when like the growth marketing replaced digital marketing as a term, and it all became very data-driven. And it's funny like how I think it's as humans, we sort of go in cycles, like we start eating super healthy and like watch what we eat and then we be like, oh man, I'm hungry all the time. I need to actually eat more. So it, everything goes sort of in cycles. And now we're seeing a huge shift back into like creativity. Like, okay, we're not there yet that we could let machines and data do all the work for us. So we actually need to write down these stories. We need to have a narrative behind our brand. We need to like be very, very careful about our purpose and how we value that and communicate that. And I think it's also because consumers are reacting that like we're seeing so many ads right now and I talked in the beginning about the ad blockers being there now. So we're so like used to ignoring communication. I have a three-year-old daughter and it's just amazing on YouTube when the ad comes, how her little finger starts clicking the skip ad part of the screen before the ad even starts. So it's just sort of very natural for us to ignore communication. So that's why the shift is now going really back to like how do you creatively differentiate yourselves? And I'm, I think part of that is because the data part sort of saturated, it didn't go away, but that capability is now there. Like the Google's free Google marketing platform that they launched 21, that now combines YouTube and Google ads and analytics and tag manager. It's so sophisticated. It's like, it's amazing what the platform can do and it's completely free. You need someone to take care of it, but still you have the data capability there. So it's, every, it's at everyone's disposal. Anyone can really use data now to the maximum, but how you tell your story, how you tell your purpose, how you're transparent about you. Uh, are you an interesting, I also talked about personal branding. I didn't talk about that as much as I would have wanted, but is there an interesting person behind it? Also sort of to answer your question once again, how do you choose the right partner? Do I trust this person? Is this person interesting? Uh, the rise of the influencer market. Marketing is an obvious, uh, sign of that sort of our renowned interest towards people and stories instead of just hard cold data. Did that answer your question at all? I got carried away. Okay, good. Uh, I might, if you have anything to ask, I hope I, if, if anything I, I demonstrated, I, I like to talk about this stuff. Uh, email me, WhatsApp me, call me. If, if you come to Espo region, come and say how we're at A-Grid. Uh, in Otaniemi at Aalto Campus. Uh, I love to help. Uh, my evil master plan is that if I can now help you for free by giving you a bit of advice, 
then when you start getting gaining some ground, you're not going to Google the best agency, you're going to stick with me. So I'll be happy to uh, play ball. Okay, round of applause to Jonas. And now you guys get to go to an early lunch and have a very relaxed meditative weekend at Imatran Kylpylä.